Okay. Hello. 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 So I've become somewhat something of an expert, especially scraping government websites, which is very strangely all different. So, um, so this talk was originally formatted as a tutorial for Pi Data Toronto, which is coming out next week. Um, so I kind of reformatted it to this more general talk about an experience. So please, if you would like to interrupt and ask a question or anything of that nature, you can go right ahead. It's more meant to be like free and easy and open. So the word is for humans. <laughs> so web scraping is basically the process of converting a human readable web page to a to a machine readable web page. Is it legal? I don't really know. <laughs> um, it, it's a very complicated legal thing that has a bunch of lawyers of black person but very confusing and frankly I don't know. Um, I'm not a lawyer. I know lawyers probably also don't want to be asked this question because the inherent idea of the web is so open and free that it's hard to really say that you legally can't do X. Um, there are, of course, other ways to get around that, obviously with copyright infringements and things of that nature. So if you web scrape for copyright, copyright materials, obviously you're going to get copyright complaints and things of that nature. Um, the DMCA in the, in the United States also has some web scraping kind of mentalities, but under that same point, Google has enough money spent on lawyers, and web crawling, in the, at least in the court's eyes, is the same as web, web scraping, that Google can pretty much prevent any badness from happening. Um, so, this is a good article from 2013 specifically about Canada and web scraping. Um, if you're interested in this, I would suggest reading this. It's the least amount of lawyer we speak that I found on the internet, if you're interested. Uh, Bill? What's the difference between the crawling and web scraping? Um, inherently nothing. Uh, web, web crawling is generally the process in which uh, a program or application will visit a website which would then would then search for all the links, visit all those websites, and do a continuing system until the very end of nothing. Uh, web scraping is, we are, we, it's more of, think of one as more like the, uh, um, the people who are basically in war just, you know, fighting the enemy versus like people who go at back doors and try to sneak through different ways. That's where really life's scraping. It's much more of a, we are going to get this data from this thing and that's it. We're going to get in and get out. No kind of hanging around. Is that, are you good to stop, Bunny <laughs> Okay, cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, cool. Um, so there's actually, there's also some interesting legal stuff within this. Um, our old, everyone's favorite ISP, Rogers, decided that they wanted to have this entire real estate system set up where you would be able to basically figure out, you know, all of the houses are sale in your given area regardless of real estate firm or anything like that. And they did that by scraping all of the real estate agents' websites. Um, Century 21, other ones, that, uh, Remax, all the big um, real estate firms basically sued them over that and ended up winning a Canadian court. So the major thing uh, in terms of legalization of web scraping is don't be a large corporation and do it, be a person. So even against the terms of service, yeah. It's most likely against terms of service. Um, LinkedIn would be a great example of this. Basically, anything that's useful to scrape is most likely has a terms of service against it and is more than likely you aren't allowed to do it. 
Now, most of the terms of service to discuss corporations versus a person. And again, it comes down to strange legal distinctions of, well, my web browser visited your web page. Technically, that's web scraping. Um, but again, this is all weird, kind of difficult stuff. So um, this is the really good article if you want more information on specifically more, less of the legal reason, and more of the terms of service guidelines for specific services. Now, most, most services that you actually, that want you to have access to the data generally provide you with an API system so you might have to scrape through HTML pages. Um, the ones where you actually want access to the data that don't provide you an API, one example of this is LinkedIn, don't. Um, and of course, many government websites, for whatever reason, decide that open government doesn't really matter. Including like Toronto, the city of Toronto, who has the most impossible open, gov open government ideology. Uh, we, uh, so, so the part out of Toronto, we actually tried to take some of the, the subway uh, delay um, statistics that the city of Toronto put out. And like next to impossible to understand, and that of us was like five pages missing in the middle of what any of it meant. So it's it's really annoying. First process in web scraping is you download the HTML data. This is always simple. Um, most most of you know, don't have crazy people doing JavaScript. This is opening up whatever third-party library you have to download a web page and do it through that and pass it into your programming language. Um, when you have difficult web pages that are not JavaScript-based, uh, React, uh, what is it, View, Angular, where basically you create a web page and all you see is a bunch of HTML and no content, you have to use um, basically what's called a browser wrapper. Um, one of the ones that I find the best is Selenium. Uh, Selenium basically will launch instances of your web browser, grab the page as it's rendered in your web browser, and give you the contents of the page. Now, that works great, except the new thing in React is where um, CSS is actually generated by JavaScript. And what this means is that there are the class names in an HTML element don't matter anymore. There are a bunch of random gobbledygook that's, gen that's newly generated every time the page is visited. So it's created a lot of complexity that is overwhelming. Um, there's also other issues. One example is, um, I believe it's called open.canada.ca, which is a, the Canadian government's new, we are, you know, we are a brand new, you know, Trudeau gets elected and we have all new web portals, basically. Um, one of the major problems is they've used a system called Adobe Content Management blah, 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 extensive. And this is all generated through a weird process that basically gives you JavaScript pages after JavaScript pages and no easily accessible API system throughout it. Um, it's largely meant for companies to like obfuscate anything that's put onto the web to almost like an extreme point where the only way you can actually extract the data is through a Selenium method and basically nothing else. So, downloading HTML data done. All right, so here's a table I randomly selected from the internet of GDP rates by country from 1999 to 2016. Here we have a bunch of numbers and blah, blah, blah. So let's toss this into what's called a data frame, which are there any, does anyone know data analysis stuff? Do you know R or, or pandas? Okay, great. So you're going to be fine. Everyone else is going to be horrid. <laughs> so basically what we're going to be doing is taking this table and putting it into a dictionary. Okay, so the first thing is we need to actually process the HTML through a phraser. Um, this one we're using here is a Python-based one called Beautiful Soup. Uh, in my opinion, it's the best one that you can get. Uh, the new kind of, a few years ago, everyone was doing XML versions of these scrapers. Uh, that works perfectly well, except HTML is an XML, and would, would crop out if there was even one wrong error in an HTML page, which frankly, we all done. So it kind of sucks. So here we're going to just open this HTML file I pre-downloaded so that I wouldn't get hurt by the chaos monkey. And basically, I'm tossing it into beautiful soup into their HTML phraser. 
And we got back what basically is the HTML file contents. Ooh, there we can see it. So what we want to get here is basically the actual content of the data. Now this is all headings. We're just going to go down. Okay, here we go. We have the different data, and we can see it by country. So we kind of can take note of how this HTML is structured. Um, this HTML was structured very disappointingly very well. Um, we can see here that basically everything is table chart TB body TR, which is basically this strange designer's idea of fun. Um, so as an example here, we're going to actually search. We're going to find all those records containing this. Oh, I can't. Ooh. Uh, basically containing all the TR records in that class that we saw before and basically one of those records kind of outputs to this. So we have all the different information. The next step is of course tossing this into some type of safe store. So here we're basically going through the entire data. We're doing a for loop over top of it. And here we're kind of the problem is, is when you work with HTML data or any data that's for a human, generally there's things that, that humans need to, to analyze large, especially in numbers. Um, let me see if I can show you here. So as you can see, this is this data has a bunch of empty variables, but let's go down. So here we can see that they decided to show all of their numeric numbers with a space for easy viewing. So the problem though, is they actually did this really intelligently so that the numbers wouldn't break apart when it was expanded or contracted. So they used a Unicode character for a space, and this made sure that the, the numbers stayed the same during contractions. So we're just going to quickly replace that so we get the actual just the number, which is what we care about. Yeah. So now, now that we've gotten all the data, we, have, we obviously have to get what the hell the data rows are going to be called. So we're going to look for the TH, the head, basically do the exact same thing we did before, grab it, and get out the, the column names. All right. So now it's time for data analysis. Now, the vast majority of time when you're web scraping, you actually care about the data at the other end. So you want to import it into, maybe you, you import it into, um, I forgot what open office is called now. Net? LibreOffice. <laughs> you want to import it to LibreOffice or CSV file, you want to do whatever. I'm a Python person and who used to do R, so I imported it into Pandas. Um, Pandas is actually, now Python is actually the most common data analysis programming language. <laughs> Um, Pandas is basically a wrap around every one of R's functionality and tossing it into Python. Um, this is really cool because basically everything that R was great about is now fully in, into Python. So here we're basically putting it into a data frame. A data frame is basically a, a, diction it's a glorified dictionary. Um, there's probably a more data analysis -y statistical definition of it, but that's basically it. Um, here we're basically saying that data we collected from before and phrased, we're going to toss it in. These are the columns. And then we have this nice little head method which shows us the first five records so that we can view it and see. Um, you can notice here that it automatically puts in an index value. That's just an R-ism that kind of got carried over. And we have all these things. Now, one of the major problems with this data is because we're importing from a human readable thing, all the numbers are strings. So we have to actually convert them to a numeric number. So here we're basically using, um, this is actually using another Python library called NumPy, which is, as it sounds, numbers in Python. It basically does a bunch of, it handles a bunch of the things that a common um, dynamic language doesn't provide in terms of numeric values. So as you can see here, we actually have a non-applicable number format and a bunch of other things. So here we're just kind of doing it, and if it's empty, we're just carrying, ignoring it. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to set the index to location. We're going to transpose all the data, which then basically flips it. So the previous one was like this, with location and location name going down, and now we're transposing it and making locations go on top. And within the years, and then our final thing is we print a nice chart. 
Now, I did a lot of stuff to make this chart look pretty because by default, it looked horrible. <laughs> but at, in the end of the day, this is basically all web scraping is. Is it's taking a bunch of human readable data that frankly might, may or may not be actually what you want it to be and then transposing it into something that you could actually display during a presentation. Um, so yeah, that's about it. Uh, is there any questions or anything? Yeah. Would you recommend anything in uh, Python for um, emailing you or notifying you the results of your web scraping? Do you use any Python? Oh, like long processes? Yeah, like, like something you might set up as a cron job to web scrape a certain piece of data and if you know something's true or not to have it email you or something. Uh, so Python has a built-in uh, SMTP library that's really good. Um, called? Yeah, I think it's just SMTP lib. Okay. It's built into core. Um, there's also on top of that there is um, the email function as well, which prepares emails. So if you wanted an HTML table, you can basically do that within that system as well. That's also in core. Um, there is also um, Alex, who's the guy who wrote requests? Yeah, that guy wrote um, email in Python for humans. I don't remember the name of the library, but request guy email for Python for humans will find it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jeff? Yes, I have. Um, so the open, you're talking about the Gorilla Archive people. Oh, the one that's like governmentally sanctioned one, the the Toronto government one. Yeah, the the problem I found, especially with what I find in, so when when Obama got elected. He pushed, I believe it was called 18F, which was this entire government standardization for opening data, making things accessible, this whole gamut for websites. But the large push was open data. And I think because it kind of became this political message, a bunch of other governments have kind of lobbied on to the name of open data, but they tend not to release anything. So what you're left with is like these really complex... Yeah, and or, or like... Um, there, there are some strange privacy laws that are in Ontario that don't exist anywhere else in Canada. So some of the data can't be exported or it gets like, um, what is it called when they put black marker? Redacted and stuff. And I, I, I understand we have some privacy issues, but um, as an example, I, I do a lot of work in scraping uh, who received government grants. And in Alberta, I can see every government grant that has been received from everyone since 1980, including individuals, and how much they got and what program they applied for. And that's all accessible in a CSV file. Um, Toronto and Ontario and Canada have, they, they love to claim they're open data, but their version of open data is basically, here's a web page that the only way to do it is paginating through 150 pages. Um, it, it's kind of depressing because I, I, I understand, like, and this is, it, 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 I, I hate to go political about this, but when, when Trump got elected, we were all really afraid that, for instance, climate data was going to be gone from the Internet, which it did. And um, one of the major issues, so like the Gorilla Archiving Club basically was started to just download all the data. And, and kind of move it out of the United States and try to get it off all of the U.S. government servers. And if, if, the, if a government agency isn't going to be open with their data enough, we can elect a tyrant or, or I'm not saying we're going to elect a tyrant in Canada, but we could elect a tyrant who's like anti-open open data, and then one day nothing is there, not even that paginated thing paginated thing. So I think it's, it's really important and I just, I don't, Toronto and Ontario and Canada and the lower aren't doing a good enough job at it. Like, especially like, and there's, there's also issues too, like there's no real good archive place. Like archive.org is great, but they disallow a lot of archives for some reason. Like, 
you have to be as like they'll let every Grateful Dead concert be on, but they'll just they'll start deleting other stuff that they don't see as important. And before Trump got elected, a lot of that stuff was climate data was like good usable climate data that just got deleted from archive.org because they saw it as useless. So I, I yeah, and I, okay, maybe I'm getting off a tangent that's more from a personal issue or something, but I don't know. It just, it grinds my gears. Yes, this is a personal issue I have, but basically, like, any uh, open data from the Department of Energy and Agriculture also uh, exposing all corruption in the government. <laughs> so the more serious and most most of the data too that we analyze on like I think it was there was there's an interesting statistic that came out after Trump got elected that a huge portion of our data that like journalists use like crime data statistics and all these other statistics come from the US federal government like they are getting a lot of that data and then they are writing articles about certain things and I don't know, I think in a democracy, we need access to that data. And I'm not saying you, like, everyone needs it, but, you know, give it to someone to do something with. Yeah. It needs to be some sort of everybody. Yeah. If it's not everybody, then you've then got a selection process. You have to have a selection process to say who it is. You yeah. There's two choices, it's everybody or the final group. Yeah. I don't know. So I'm sorry. You're. I have been to that meetup. Sorry, I'll get back to your regular question. <laughs> and um, yeah, it was it was cool, but I don't know. I just I feel they need to do more work, the the government themselves, from a municipal standpoint. And there is also issues too. Like you obviously don't want to give out personal data. So I understand why data sometimes takes a while to get because we need to scrub it for personal information and things of that nature. But after a certain point, we should have access to it in some fashion. Uh-huh. Uh, the specific example is uh, the nation's political party ex-politician. So Martin Halpern was running for the head of the Liberal Party. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah there, there's, a, there's a lot of weird stuff like I find with FIFA requests, especially I've been dealing with them a lot, and they they love to give you a scan of a fax of a scan of a fax of a scan of a photocopy, <laughs> and it's all very strange. Like, you get these kind of weird disformed tables, and I always feel kind of bad because the only way I've ever, like the only not hugely expensive solution for converting a PDF file that has a table to an Excel file or a CSV file is is Adobe, uh, the Adobe Acrobat Document Center thing is really the only way to do it, which makes it really strange because you're like, okay, so I got this, this thing the government gave me is this document that they had to give me. Now I need to take a proprietary application that I have to pay like a monthly fee for to then get it converted to an Excel spreadsheet, which is yet another proprietary doc, you know, format. And I, I don't know, it's just, I, I know it's kind of like pie in the sky type of thoughts, but sometimes you kind of want that. Like there was a really interesting thing. Um, this was a lot of years ago, but does anyone remember in the UK the, the expense report scandal? Uh, most famously, one of the M well, one of the lords uh, um, got back money for his moat cleaning from the UK government. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, yeah. 
So there is an interesting thing about that where um, the Guardian d developed this application that basically took every one of these horrible MP scanned expense reports <laughs> and basically crowd crowdsourced the entire like extracting data from it because they tried their hardest to make sure that no one was going to be able to read them well. And it was, it was really fascinating, their, their application and their process of doing it, and how long it took them to actually process all of these gazillion page scan documents. And I think it was only a matter of a couple weeks. They got every single one, and they even had a, a button on it where you would be instantly notify a reporter if you thought that, the, that it was interesting. Yeah. You got a doing one page. <laughs> I, I kind of always had this this kind of I don't know this idea with um, Amazon's mechanized trunk, where you can do a similar process. But in my experience, um, the the certain way, like things are done in a certain way in Canada that are different than the UK and 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 Ireland and the United States and. So it's really difficult to do mechanized trunk because you don't really know where the mechanized people are. <laughs> oh, sorry, I, I always forget the name of it. Uh, Siemens wrote a, a custom OCR program that was really, really good at recognizing slightly mongle, mangle fonts on the fly did have, did have to have a human to, to train it so that they could convert all the East German documents into something that was scannable or in, in printable. Cool. Actually, I remember Stuart gave a really great talk on OCR, yes. <laughs> which I believe was recorded. Yeah, so. yeah it was. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe it was ocr <laughs> <laughs> from, uh, but uh, it is estimated that more than 50% of all the documents the U.S. ever produced is still classified secret or above. So even the stuff that they're obfuscating is not the important data. <laughs> yeah. I, I, have, I have to say that the, the, the climate data was really scary for a large number of financial institutions because a lot of their data was getting directly from the United States government, and they were definitely afraid that Trump, the Trump administration was going to get rid of it, and they would all of a sudden have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars setting up weather stations in Iowa <laughs> to capture the data they needed. <laughs> uh, is there any reason why these uh, I, don't, I don't know if it was removed so much as just, like, hidden. Basically, um, it, it literally seemed there was numerous just random things that for what it could have just been that they didn't want the pages anymore. Um, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. Um, one of the, the really interesting ones was um, the accessibility information. So how to access the web page if you're blind or, or different things that might impair your, kind of your done. Your usage of a website was all removed from the government websites as well. So it was really strange just what was going on and why it was kind of removed. Um, I remember I, I'm a part of one of the, um, I think it's called Front End Developers Slack. And when the, the day, I think whatever January day it was where the transition happened, we were on the general Slack channel just discussing, you know, Trump's new websites and all of the stuff they've randomly removed or all of the standards that they went back on that Obama started doing, the open web standards, that they stopped doing and stuff. And it was literally, it was really scary because it looked like everything went back 10 years, like before Obama got elected. Like, I don't, it, it's such a weird thing to do. I, I just couldn't, like... I don't know, but yeah. it, it seemed because even Bush was was trying to push the open government in his last few few years in office as well, and his stuff was removed. And I don't know, it, it was a scary it was a scary day for many reasons. <laughs> so, um, anything else? 
Okay, awesome. So um, that's it for the meeting. Um, <laughs> um, for each detailed like meeting, we go to the library.